Okay. Uh, we welcome uh, the President of Ecuador, Rafael Correa. So good afternoon. It's my opportunity uh, to uh, introduce today's speaker. My name is Scott Strobel. I am a professor of molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale University. I'm also the vice president for West Campus Planning and Program Development. Uh, earlier today, I had the honor of hosting President Correa's delegation and showing them some of the work underway uh, in my laboratory. Every year from 2008 through 2014, even just a few weeks ago, I have had the opportunity to take Yale and Ecuadorian students, undergraduate students, to the Ecuadorian Amazon, the rainforest, where we collect plant samples that we study in the laboratories of Yale and Catholic University in Quito. President Correa's visit is especially meaningful to me and my students, since Ecuador's Amazon is the rainforest and is the place where many of them have fallen in love with field research and where many have been inspired to pursue careers in science. These students have discovered potentially beneficial organisms that reside within the plants of the rainforest. To date, they have identified organisms that eat plastic, produce fuel from simple sugars, fight diseases, and many more. These are there are undoubtedly many more scientific discoveries to be made through the discovery of microbial diversity in Ecuador's forests. These are remarkable wild places that are treasures to the nation and to the world. I hope there will continue to be opportunity for Yale and Ecuadorian students to discover these places together. As I have traveled to Ecuador for a short period every year, literally the first two weeks in March every year from 2008 till 2014, it has given me a very unusual perspective on the country. I don't see it every day, um, but I see it in an annual brief perspective, a snapshot in which I can compare progress of the country from year to year. We started our trips just after President Correa began as president. Over the next years, I have seen his vision for economic development unfold. He has committed significant resources to infrastructure and education and this is immediately now evident throughout the nation. Three years ago when I was there, there was a new bridge in Coca. Two years ago, there was a new airport in Quito. This year, there was a new airport in Esmeraldas. The country has literally been transformed over the period of his presidency. And I have had the opportunity from year to year to see it. Of particular interest, uh, particularly to us at Yale, is President Correa's commitment to make a major investment in education and technology. There are now four new public universities under construction in Ecuador, including the construction of the continent's first planned city, one that has a university focused on technology at its core. There is also a university under construction in the rainforest with hundreds of square miles of forest set aside for preservation and study. It is a remarkable, foresighted investment in Ecuador's and South America's future. Mr. Correa studied in Ecuador, Belgium, and the United States, earning a PhD in economics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2001. Returning home, he served his country as finance minister before running for president in 2006. He not only won that first election, he has subsequently been re-elected twice by landslide margins. Uh, one thing that was interesting in our most rec recent trip, apparently the election had just happened, and so there were pictures of President Correa uh, throughout the country being photographed with a series of uh, local uh, uh, candidates. His, administration, uh, his administrations have succeeded in reducing the high level of po poverty, indigence, and unemployment in Ecuador. He remains very popular at home, and he emphasizes education and opportunity for Ecuadorian citizens. Today, President Correa will talk about his vision for Ecuador and South America in a talk entitled Ecuador's Political, Sci Political Science and Knowledge Transformation. President Correa has generously offered to answer a few questions uh, from the ones that have been submitted from those uh, from the audience, uh, and I will, um, uh, uh, I will offer those questions or, or provide those questions to President Correa. 
So please join me in welcoming the President of the Republic of Ecuador, Rafael Correa. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, as Pro Professor Strobel mentioned, uh, we're going to try to speak today about Ecuador political science and technological transformation. Uh, really, I am truly honored to be able to share a few thoughts with the academic community of such a historic and prestigious, prestigious university. You may know that, and Professor mentioned this, that before entering politics, I was myself an academic. I was fortunate enough to earn a master in economics and a PhD, also in economics, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign during four of the happiest years of my life. <laughs> and upon, uh, to study, come on, it's a, a very good thing, huh? <laughs> come on. And upon returning to Ecuador, I became a university professor and dedicated my life to teaching and research in the field of economics and development. Believe me when I say that there is only one thing that I love more than teaching, and that is learning, which is why I truly envy you. I am, of course, glad to serve my country to the best of my abilities, but at times, especially when politics displays its petty, spiteful, disappointing face, I really wish I could be back in the classroom. <laughs> I would like to express my profound gratitude to Yale University, its workers, professors, and students for this invitation. Allow me to tell you about a fascinating country, the most compact, mega diverse country in the world. If we consider both terrestrial and marine biodiversity, Ecuador has, has the largest number of species on the planet in a territory just over 109,000 square miles, about the size of the state of Nevada, where one finds all climates and microclimates imaginable. In Ecuador, we have four worlds. In a single day, a tourist can have breakfast along the beaches of the Pacific with fresh seafood, then have lunch at the foot of Cayambe, a majestic Andean mountain snow-covered year round, right on the equator, and finally have dinner deep in the Amazon jungle. The next day, after a flight lasting less than two hours, our tourists, amazed, can be in the Galapagos Island, one of the seven natural wonders of the world. Ecuador loves life. Our constitution is the first in the world to grant rights to nature, 20% of our territory is protected in 49 reserves and national parks, among them Yasuni Park, a jungle treasure, and a world biosphere reserve, where in just one third of a square mile, you can find a great variety of trees than in all of North America. No doubt, given its diversity and geographic location, Ecuador is the eco-center of the world. In Ecuador, in seven days, you can sample of all of Latin America, its beaches, its mountains, its jungles, its islands, and most important, its people. <clears throat> as, I, as I shared yesterday at my talk at Harvard, the Argentinians, very proudly proclaim, the Pope is Argentinian. <laughs> My dear friend Dilma Rousseff, the president of Brazil, Argentina's eternal rival in soccer, and in other things too, okay, <laughs> says, well, the Pope may be Argentinian, but God is Brazilian. <laughs> in Ecuador, we do not have any problem with that. Certainly, the Pope is Argentinian. God, God is probably Brazilian, but paradise is Ecuadorian. <laughs> you are always welcome in Ecuador. 
Dear students, dear professors, dear friends, after years of studying development, I can assure you that development, at least in the Latin American context, is basically a political problem. A problem of who is in charge in society, in a society, the elites or the vast majority, capital or human beings, society or the market. A country's institutions, policies, and programs depend on who holds power. This was already noted centuries earlier by French thinker Frédéric Bastiat. I quote, when plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men living together in society, they create for themselves, in the course of time, a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that glorifies it, end of quote. The greatest harm that has been done to economics is to disassociate it from its original nature as political economy. We have been led to believe that everything is a technical issue and in not considering the power relations within a society, we have been made subservient to the dominant powers. Paraphrasing the great economist, John Kenneth Galbraith, the economist that do not acknowledge questions of power is completely useless. The political economy during the period of the Revolución Ciudadana, this is the name of our project, uh, political project, Revolución Ciudadana, Citizen Revolution in English. The political economy during the period of the Revolución Ciudadana has made it possible to bring about a steady reduction in poverty and inequality. In the period from 2006 to 2013, poverty has fallen from 37.6% to 25.6%. Extreme poverty has fallen from 16.9% to 8.6%. And the Gini coefficient has decreased eight points. The growth of the Ecuadorian economy has clearly been pro-poor. The pace at which incomes have grown among the poorest percentiles has been faster than the rising incomes for the wealthiest. That situation suggests a process of socioeconomic convergence in Ecuadorian, so in Ecuadorian society. There is a steady reduction in economic polar polarization. During the period analyzed, the ratio in income earned between the richest 10% and the poorest 10% fell from 35 to 1 to 24 to 1, a gap is a, that is a still morally unjustified. One observes a process of territorial convergence, which is to say that the reduction in poverty is greater in those provinces that had the highest levels of poverty before our government. Professor Strobel mentioned the beautiful new bridge in Coca. Well, this is the Amazon region. Usually this region uh, had nothing. And this is the most modern bridge in the country right now. We have included sectors that we were historically marginalized. One clear example of th is that, one clear example is that as a result of the policy of eliminating economic barriers, and having recovered quality public services, educational enrollment has steadily increased with the greatest gains in the poorest quantiles. The public policy that we have put in place, sorry, the public policy that we have put in place has made it possible to extend the middle class. And while we can observe a steady improvement in the standard of living for the whole population in terms of income, one of every four Ecuadorians has moved to a higher economic stratum. In other words, there is clear evidence of upward social mobility. To give you an idea of where the country is heading, if the social trends continue, by 2015, we will achieve all the targets stipulated in the United Nations Millennium development goals. I must clarify that for us, these goals represent the minimum acceptable levels since our own programmatic agenda as defined in the Plan Nacional del Buen Vivir is much more ambitious 
reflecting what our country truly needs. According to the 2012 United Nations Human Development Report, <clears throat> during the 2007-2012 period, which coincides with our administration, Ecuador is one of the three countries in the world that advanced the most in terms of human development, improving its ranking from medium human development to high human development. As a result of the 1999 crisis, millions of Ecuadorian emigrates. They were forced to leave the country, destroying families and tearing up the social fabric. Additionally, the economy shrank by 7.6%. Unemployment shot up to almost 15%. The national currency was eliminated and the dollar was adopted as the legal tender. It was really a social tragedy. But these immigrants are our heroes. They are the ones who sustained our country with the hard earned dollars that they sent home to help us overcome the crisis. Several of these citizens, Ecuador citizens, migrants came to Connecticut, New Haven. Thank you very much for receiving them. And you have to appreciate, appreciate their sacrifice because really they are modern heroes. The instability was such. Si están aquí presentes algunos de ellos, un fraterno saludo y el agradecimiento a la patria por todo lo que hicieron. The instability was such that up until 2007, no administration was able to complete a term. In 10 years, there were seven presidents. Today, Ecuador is one of the most stable democracies in Latin America. Since 2006, La Revolución Ciudadana has won 10 consecutive elections including two presidential elections in the first round, which was unthinkable in Ecuador's recent history. We have the highest public approval rating across the continent. Democracy has been firmly established in Ecuador. Not only democracy in the formal sense, but real democracy in terms of people's access to rights, equal opportunities, and dignified living conditions. This is the so-called Ecuadorian miracle. Though in development, there are no miracles. The striking changes that have taken place are basically the result of the change in power relations accomplished by means of deeply democratic processes. Today, in Ecuador, it is the Ecuadorian people who are in charge. But the problem of development is that it requires many things that are necessary, none of, which, none of which in itself is sufficient. Power may be in the hands of the large majority, and one may be able to attain more equitable distribution, yet have only misery to distribute. Science and technology as drivers of wealth are fundamental for development. That is probably the secret to the success of the United States, a country where 1% of the population controls 35.6% of the wealth, and 10% of the population controls 75% of the wealth. Such concentrated economic power normally destroys society, destroys a society, but it has been a system that has made possible great technological advances, and with them, productivity and income gains that have improved life for all. While we have made substantial leaps forward in Ecuador in social and political terms, that change has not been accompanied by major changes and improvements in the productive sphere. And one of Ecuador's greatest problems continues to be the low level of productivity in its economy. To resolve this disconnect between social policy and production, we have adopted an aggressive national policy to promote the development of science, technology, and innovation, in which the universities, 
play a fundamental role. Perhaps I could, I could point out that the United States has not fallen further, further than it has in this world economic crisis thanks to the role played by these magnificent universities, such as Yale, in the country's economy. <clears throat> we are not falling into the trap of technological absolutism, in which all of a society has to be organized in function of technological requirements. Albert Einstein is credited with having said, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. But, but neither do we believe in childish fundamentalism, in which premodernity is thought to be tantamount to good living, and misery is part of folklore. Not only that, these fundamentalisms, which verge on irresponsibility, play into the hands of the new and unjust international division of labor, as we will see in a few moments. You must know that nowadays, every five years, new knowledge doubles. This means that countries that do not generate knowledge are twice as ignorant every five years, and above all, twice as depending on what others produce. Either we seek to reduce distances, or we will be isolated and subordinated as a develop developing country when it comes to innovation and science. <clears throat> For these reasons, higher education has been a central focus of our government's policies, and one for which it has been loaded within Latin America. Many of our neighbors have been taken aback by the bold wave of reforms we have carried out these last few years. Ecuador is now known as the country that established the free nature of public higher education, and did so in its new constitution the country that closed down 14 universities because of their filing quality, and the, con the country that, over a seven-year period, increased its investment in higher education from 1.1% to 2% of GDP, demonstrating a strong political will to make knowledge, the formation of human talent, and science and technology the pillars of the new Ecuador. The results have been, by all standards, astounding, with significant improvement in the quality of the universities and the democratization of access, thanks to the eradication of tuition fees and a meritocratic system of admission. In order to understand these remarkable changes, we have to go back to the Constituent Assembly of 2008, entrusted with the responsibility of drafting a new constitution. When they came to discuss in the state of our higher education system, the members of the assembly had to admit that Ecuador's university system did not compare favor favor favorably to many of its Latin American neighbors. This conclusion was even more worrisome in light of another conclusion. Latin American universities Latin American universities, notwithstanding a few noteworthy exceptions, do not compare favorably with universities in other parts of the world, including, evidently, the United States. <clears throat> Undoubtedly, the wave of deregulation during the neoliberal heyday of the 1990s and early 2000s was particularly detrimental to our higher education system. Universities sprang up at every street corner. In Ecuador, between 1992 and 2006, that is, barely 14 years, 45 universities were created, of a total of 71 universities nationwide, many of which were what you might call in the United States degree mills or ghost universities what in Latin America we call garage universities. 
fundamentally for profit businesses managed by people with little or no scruples, virtually selling degrees to Golibow and in some cases not so Golibow students. As a direct consequence of this growing anarchy in higher education, the Constituent Assembly ordered an in-depth evaluation of all 71 universities. In 2009, a first report was issued by Ecuador's accreditation agency, which ranked universities in five categories, from A to E. The country was shocked to learn that 26 institutions were in the E category. Over a third of Ecuador's universities were exposed in this evaluation as extremely poor quality institutions. It took a new law of higher education approved in our National Assembly in 2010 to give these 26 universities an ultimatum, show significant improvements or face closer at the turn of a new evaluation process to be carried out within 18 months of the passing of the new law. The second evaluation took place, and in April 2012, 14 institutions that did not deserve to be called universities were shut down. To ensure the rights of the students who were enrolled in those institutions, the Ecuadorian government developed a complex contingency plan, which was without doubt the greatest academic intervention in the history of Ecuador. The sole purpose of this measure was to put right one of the biggest scams and social lies that the country has experienced. Over 40,000 students enrolled in these dismal universities were rescued by the state and re-enrolled in the remainder of Ecuador's universities. Not only were 14 universities shut down, but we also closed 44 out of a total of 86 university extensions. Fundamentally, satellite campuses that function at a distance from the university headquarters. These were created at a time when, for primarily political and electoral reasons, mainly public university, universities opened extensions all over the country to supposedly decentralize high education, higher education. The result was disastrous. Poor rural areas were given token third-rate universities as political favors and handouts. The outcome was evidently that the vicious circle of discrimination was exacerbated because the poor were given the worst institution and services. Aside from the relocation of over 40,000 40, students, we have also come up with more structural answers to the phenomenon of highly decentralized, decentralized poor quality higher education. Having universities with a certain scale and national scope is an important part of the solution, especially if it is accompanied by grants, scholarships, stipends, student residence, etc., so that previously excluded sectors can access higher education. Another important solution concerns technical and technological education. <clears throat> Something that overall in the Americas we have not always valued as much as we should. The Europeans on that front have proven that not all the student population needs to study in universities, but that an important proportion, up to 60% in the case of Germany, can study more vocational and professionalizing establishments. In the case of Ecuador, a country with very ambitious aspirations regarding the diversification of its, of its economy and the, and the change of its production metrics, including a strong drive toward industrialization and increased productivity, it is vital to have a highly, highly skilled and trained technical workforce. This is why we are currently investing more than $300 million to strengthen and often build from scratch 
dozens of technical institutes that are strategically located and articulated to the production sector. Let us not forget that the university that closed down largely specialized in cheap programs, so as to maximize profits, mostly in the field of administrations, business, and commerce. These are undoubtedly important areas of study, but with low demand in the job market and with an even lower impact on production and productive transformation. Technical institutes help make education relevant to the prerogative of national development. Many of the problems identified in Ecuador's higher education system, including academic fraud, correspond to well-known phenomena recurrent in many countries throughout Latin America and the world. But unlike other countries facing similar challenges, Ecuador had the political will to tackle, to tackle the issue, tackle the issue, to bear the economical cost of the contingent plan, as well as face up to the potential political cost of conflict the closure could generate. The closure of the universities sent a strong signal to the university system as a whole. The message was very clear. Ecuador needs quality higher education at the service of cultural, social, and economic change. As a result of this national cause, the improvement of our universities, some quality indicators have already improved. Between 2009 and 2013, the number of professors with doctoral degrees has almost doubled. There are many more full-time teachers, especially in the context of certain private universities that had virtually none, and as, a and as a result, had no academic or scientific community. We have doubled publications in indexed journals. Ecuador also boasts the highest rate of growth in the innovation index in the region, according to the World Economic Forum for 2013. And there has been significant improvement in infrastructure with better university libraries, laboratories, and facilities, amongst many other things. The argument that there were no funds for these improvements does not hold up because many universities had made major investments in costly university extensions. <clears throat> Another strong incentive for improving quality was the design and implementation of a new formula for the distribution of state funds to public universities. Before our government, universities received their budget incrementally, never less than the amount received in the previous year. And they received a set amount per student, regardless of the cost of the program. <clears throat> this, of course, was an incentive to offer cheap programs of little relevance. Today, the formula of allocation of state, of state funds to universities considers the real cost of programs as well as their quality. This has proven very effective for universities to maximize efforts towards quality. New national rules for tenure also mean that teachers now receive a decent, a decent pay in public universities. Indeed, the most competitive academic salaries in the region. This, alongside other policies that stimulate the return of Ecuadorians that they left the country because of the brain drain, has been successful at fostering the birth of an academic profession and career. In Ecuador, Nobody, and yet everybody, was a university professor. Everybody gave classes alongside their other professional activities, but very few were actually full-time academics. The new salary and tenure meant almost 90% increase in the salaries of academics over a, a five-year period. In addition, the Prometeo project a system of state grants that allows the recruitment and hiring of international academics fully paid by the Ecuadorian government to work in our universities has further helped boost academic excellence. 
The lasting solution for our higher education is to improve its human talent and to encourage the emergence of a new generation of academics fully devoted to academia. This is one of the reasons why Ecuador currently has almost 8,000 scholarship recipients. Most of them are graduate students enrolled in the world's best university. I think we have an example of our scholarships here in Yale. Melissa, Melissa Arias. Is here Melissa, no? Well, we have a student with a scholarship here in Yale. Okay. This represents the highest per GDP investment in grants in Latin America and a huge commitment on behalf of our government. In the last seven years, we have given out more grants and scholarships than during the whole history of Ecuador prior to our administration. If our universities have been, <clears throat> with noteworthy exceptions of poor, of poor quality, it does not follow that they have been of easy access to the people, especially poor people. Rather, we inherited a system which functioned as a mechanism for the reproduction of the unequal structure of social classes and distinctions, and further deepened the segmentation of Ecuadorian society. Poor people could not enter university. In this regard, as a government, we have refused to accept the classic dilemma or trade-off between equity and quality, where we must supposedly choose between democratizing the system under the principle of e equity or favor merit and academic excellence under the principle of quality. Our policies have shown the world that it is indeed possible for both principles to be harmoniously combined and that this zero-sum game is essentially a fallacy. Ecuador has doubled the enrollment numbers from the poorest sector of society and of the historically excluded indigenous and African Ecuadorian populations. According to the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America, Ecuador has now and has become the country with the highest percentage of enrollment of its poorest quantile in the region. The constitutional guarantee of free public higher education has done much for the democratization of, of access. And so have the grants and the scholarships, the new national system of leveling and admissions for higher education has also eliminated the long waiting lines and the use of personal networks to get into college. Our system of admissions, given the huge disparities that still exist in high school education, is based on an entrance, an entrance exam that measures skills and abilities and not just knowledge. Finally, we have created four new public and therefore free world-class universities for the development of key areas of the country. All four projects seek to combine quality, democratization, and relevance to development. The first is the National University of Education, UNAI, primarily dedicated to the training of teachers and specialists that will become part of the national education system. <clears throat> it is self-evident that there can be no long-term sustainable generation of human talent without excellent early childhood, primary and secondary education. It is on this premise that the 2008 Constitution establishes a mandatory 0.5% annual increase in the budget of education until it reaches 6% of GDP. Currently, the Ministry of Education, which is not in charge of higher education, separate, manage the largest share in the national budget, 12% of the total. There is no time to go into the detail of our policies in general education, but there have been great advances in coverage, infrastructure, and quality. Unfortunately, in Ecuador, 
as in many parts of the world, teaching has become one of the less prestigious and desirable of, of professions. Students aspiring to be teachers obtained, on average, the lowest scores in their university entry exams. We're changing this reality by encouraging the most talented youth to become teachers and to give prestige to the noblest of all professions. One of the policy, <coughs> connected to weather, you know, <laughs> very cold. And I was born in a very hot city. One of the policies that we have put in place is a system of minimum standards for different professions. For students wanting to become teachers, they must meet the highest standard, the same as candidates for medicine. If the student is accepted, he or she will receive the equivalent of a minimum wage during the period of, st of the study. So we pay a, a student in order to follow teaching. These rigorous standards and important incentive accompanied by the creation of the new university of education, seek to incorporate a new generation of highly motivated and qualified teachers into the system. The second university was created, they are already created, professor, okay? Three of, out of four. Ikian will start uh, classes next September, but uh, Universidad de las Artes, uh, Universidad Docente, y Yachay, they have already courses, classes, students, everything. The second university was created in the, is the University of Arts, whose central mission is artistic research, creation, production, diffusion, and the formation of the country's best talent in arts and culture. Culture and arts play a fundamental role in giving greater texture, identity, and memory to our societies, as well as greater depth to our democracies. And we should not underestimate the role cultural industries can play in changing our production matrix, as it has been demonstrated in the United States, where cultural industries represent 12% of GDP. The third university we have created is Ikian, which means rainforest in the indigenous Shuar language a university in the Amazon dedicated to the generation of bio-knowledge. Professor Strobel used to work in our Amazon region. Could you imagine to have a, a world-class university there in the middle of the rainforest? Well, that is Ikea. The campus itself lies in the middle of a 355 square mile natural reserve and is alive laboratory for the study of biodiversity, which we believe will be the great resource of the 21st century. If we want to exert sovereignty over the Amazon, we need to study our fauna, flora, water resources, and geology. Ikian is an answer to this challenge. And finally, the fourth university, Yachay, which means learn, imperative, learn in our ancestral Quechua language, and which we have described as the most important project in our country's history. It's a new university for experimental scientific research. Located in a beautiful area of northern Ecuador, it is the cornerstone of a new city of knowledge and innovation, the very first planned technological city in Latin America. Yachay, which opened its gate to its first student last week, is dedicated to nanoscience, information technology, life science, renewable energy, and petrochemicals. <clears throat> the new university seeks to put an end to Ecuador's subservient role as a producer of primary goods an importer of high added value goods within the international system. Yachay perhaps best exemplifies the aspiration of a country that has given up on generating knowledge, but now says we can and we dare produce science. None of these 
is of course possible without political will. Not the closure of 14 universities, not the granting of free education, not the massive public investment needed to create extremely ambitious universities, not the 8,000 scholarships, certainly not the fact that Ecuador is today the country with the highest GDP spending in higher education. At 2% of GDP, Ecuador is by far the highest in Latin America, where average spending is 0.8% of GDP. Indeed, it is higher than the average spent by OECD countries at 1.7% of GDP. If we have dedicated so much energy, time, political capital, and resources to higher education, science, and technology, it is because we are convinced that the future will favor those who bank on knowledge as the pillar of their economies and societies. Today, Ecuadorian public investment is 15% of GDP, again, the highest in Latin America, because of that bridges, airports, etc. And you have missed a lot of new airports, huh? <laughs> you, have, you have to continue visiting us. Okay. This translates into great works, infrastructure, new roads, hydroelectric plants, ports, airports, schools, hospitals, connectivity, etc. However, an earthquake can destroy infrastructure and leave a country in ruins, but it cannot erase the human talent of its people. And it is that same human talent, that science and technology, which enables countries to overcome any earthquake, as well as any other challenges facing humanity. <clears throat> Having provided you with a quick overview of the importance we are attributing to human talent, science, knowledge, and innovation in our administration, allow me to go back to the main idea I want to discuss this afternoon. The results obtained are no miracle. They are a consequence of our being able to change the correlation of forces in these areas in my country. I'm putting first the common good of the large majorities and not the privileges of certain corporate groups. Nonetheless, the political dispute is larger in scope. He who has knowledge has power, noted the French philosopher Michel Foucault. The new cognitive capitalism created a new dependency. Every day that Microsoft decides to launch a new version of Microsoft Office, the Global South has no option other than to purchase its licenses or copy without authorization. <laughs> the visible hand of the market schedules the obsolescence of its product and follows through with precision. There will be no possible emancipation if we do not make a break with this new form of dependency. We seek, to, we seek to move from the economy of finite resources to the economy of infinite resources, which we have called the social economy of knowledge and innovation. This economy also seeks to recover the notion of knowledge as a public good. Knowledge is generally a public good. That is, technically speaking, no one can be excluded from it since we can all access since, since we can all access that knowledge and without any rivalry when it comes to consuming it since since my use of knowledge does not keep anyone else from using it as George Bernard Shaw said if you have an apple and I have an apple and we exchange these apples then you and I will still each have one apple but if you have an idea, and I have an idea, and we exchange these ideas, then each of us will have two ideas. Trying to privatize a public good by means of institutional measures, such as patents, is harmful to society as a whole. Because if there is no rivalry in consumption, then as the number of people who enjoy this good already created increases, this number, the greater the social well-being, 
well-being, sorry. This is one of the famous market failures. Are there economic students here? Yes? All my solidarity, but that is important for you. <laughs> this is one of the famous market failures. One dramatic example of the privatization of knowledge and forced exclusion is the high cost of certain medicines since they are patented. The apparently pragmatic principle of the privatization of knowledge, in addition to its social inefficiency, usually subjugates human beings to capital. The great challenge facing humanity in the 21st century is to achieve the supremacy of human beings over capital, with societies dominating markets, not markets dominating societies. The market, dear students, is a great servant but it is a terrible master. We will live in societies with markets, but not societies overruled by the market, where life, people, and society itself are treated as merely one more commodity, all in function to that entelechy called market. There are more efficient ways of promoting the production of knowledge. One alternative is greater participation by academia and by the public sector itself. Another alternative is for the state to compensate the creation of knowledge for profit, and in this way make it available, available to all humankind. The main problem with all these alternatives is that they tend to undermine ideological fundamentalisms and the rule of capital. But let's remember that the United States, for example, had a quasi-open system for knowledge management during its early period of industrialization. They only recognized national patents and did not allow foreign companies to register patents. While it is mainly the rich countries that produce science and technology, countries such as Ecuador also produce public goods produce environmental public goods. But in our case, for all the pure air generated by the Amazon jungle, the lungs of the planet without which human life will deteriorate critically, we, the countries of the Amazon basin, do not receive any compensation, while at the same time the biggest global polluters pay absolutely nothing to consume our environmental goods. But there is more nor do they want to recognize the information that exists in our biodiversity, which is often unique. One example is epibatidine, a painkiller derived from our multicolor frog, epipedobetes tricolor, it's a Latin name, don't worry about that, okay? <laughs> Whose usefulness only became known thanks to the collective and ancestral knowledge of our peoples, and which was, which was sorry, extracted by foreign scientists and exploited by international pharmaceutical companies without any benefit at all for our country. And it is sometimes thought that generating environmental goods has no cost. This is a mistake. The reality is that it can be very costly, not in terms of direct cost, but in what economists call the opportunity cost. Today, Many demand, without any moral standing, I might add, that the oil of the Amazon be left underground. But that implies an immense cost in revenues not received in every day that goes by with a child who has no school, a community without drinking water, or people dying of preventable diseases, all of which are true pathologies of misery. This is the new international division of labor. If before it was us producing raw materials and the hegemonic countries producing industrial goods with high value added, now the new and unjust international division of labor is then generating knowledge that they privatize and us environmental goods that continue to be free global public goods. And it is also a political problem of international power relation. 
Why? To illustrate this, imagine for a moment if the situation were the, op the opposite and the generators of environmental public goods were the rich countries, the powerful countries, and our countries were the polluters. Certainly, by now, they would have invaded us to make us pay fair compensation, and all in the name of civilization, rights, etc. My dear young people, students, friends, <clears throat> the world order is not only unjust, it is immoral. Everything is here to serve in the interests of the most powerful, and double standards abound. The global public goods produced by poor countries must be free, such as environmental goods, whereas the public goods produced by the hegemonic countries must be paid for with the imposition of institutional barriers, such as patents. Only by compensating environmental goods will there be an unprecedented redistribution of income internationally. But this is once again a problem of power relation, this time on an international scale. <clears throat> the big polluters refuse to sign Kyoto. But in our countries, you go to prison if you do not pay to use a patented product. What is most sad is that oftentimes, the poor countries themselves participate enthusiastically in such absurd mechanis mechanism. And we do not even understand the instruments used to keep us in the role assigned to us by, the, by this new division of labor. For example, as our dear friend, Alvaro Garcia Linera, the vice president of Bolivia, and one of the greatest Latin American thinkers of our time. Is there here someone from Bolivia? Well, for Bolivian people, congratulations. They have a, a standing vice president. As Alvaro has said, I quote, several NGOs are not really non-governmental organizations but organizations of other governments in our territory. And the vehicle for introducing a type of colonial environmentalism that relegates to the indigenous people the role of caretakers for the, Amaz for the Amazon forest. I can quote. <clears throat> By investing in human talent, science, technology, and promoting innovation, we will overcome the economy based on extracting natural resources, but in an intelligent, responsible, and sovereign fashion. Without the absurdity of sitting up, sitting on the top, sitting on top of a gold mine and begging, rather than harnessing our natural resources to meet our people's needs. We are perfectly aware of our limitations as a small country and that we cannot change an unjust world, world, sorry, order. We cannot change an unjust world order. But nor will we passively accept the role that has been assigned to us in the new international division of labor. No one should have any doubt about it. A large part of our second and definitive independence is making ourselves generators of knowledge and breaking down that immoral international division of labor to which we are subjugated. Dear students, professors, friends, <clears throat> I firmly believe in the transformative power of science and technology. Indeed, <clears throat> it is in this power of science and technology that I place a large part of my hope, my hope in the future of the planet. The sustainability of our way of life and the possibility of attaining good living for all humankind. For a long time, I have considered that any effort to summarize processes as complex as the advance of human societies into simplistic principles of, or laws, whether you call it the dialectical materialism or rational self-interest, is doomed to fail. And I also convinced that scientific and technological gains 
can generate great well-being and be greater drivers of social change than any class struggle or pursuit of individual wealth. The development of agriculture converted humanity from a nomadic to a sedentary way of life. The Industrial Revolution transformed humanity from rural life to urban life for the majority. And much more recently, the spectacular advance of information technologies transformed industrial societies to knowledge society, societies. I believe that the political, economic, and social systems that will prevail in the future will be those that allow for the greatest scientific and technological advances, but also, and this is very important, their better use for the common good. <clears throat> dear students, dear professors, dear friends, Ecuador has decided to base its development on the only sources of wealth that cannot be depleted, human talent and human knowledge to attain development in a sustainable but also sovereign way. Thank you very much. President Correa has uh, agreed to take some questions uh, from the audience that have been provided in advance, and so I will, uh, I will read them, uh, but I'll take the first one. Um, and that is um, the, the economic engine that has driven um, the transformation that has occurred in Ecuador largely comes through the oil of uh, the Amazon region. And so the challenge there is sustaining the beauty of that biodiversity with uh, extracting the resource of the oil that's underneath that biodiversity. The pro ITT project is a uh, effort to try to reconcile these two uh, challenges. And so I would like to get your thoughts and opinions on how that project went, uh, what the lessons are to be learned from it, and... Sorry, what project? The ITT... Initiative. The, Just the initiative, ITT yes. Initiative. And, um, how to move forward with a sustainable extraction of the oil in the Amazon. OK, thank you very much for this question. First of all, I would like to, to, do a, uh, to precise something. Uh, oil income is important, but it's not the most important source of revenue for our country. Actually, uh, in, uh, oil income is just 20% of the total income in the budget, or at least 20% of the total budget. Of course, to have high oil prices is uh, good for us, but uh, that doesn't explain all what is going on in our country. And uh, I didn't mention this in this speech, but we renegotiate oil contracts because with the older oil contracts called uh, contratos de participación. These con contracts were established uh, in the 90s when the barrel, the barrel price was uh, around $16. And the companies gave to the state, to the government, just four or five dollars per barrel. Later, the prices shot up. They reached $60 uh, per barrel, $70, and they continue giving us 4 or $5 per barrel, according to the old contracts. So we renegotiate the contracts, and now the situation is the opposite. They receive a fixed amount per barrel, $10, $12, according to the cost of extraction, and a reasonable profit for them. And the rest, independent of the price, $20, $200, $2,000 is for the owner of the oil, that is Ecuadorian people. So what I want to say that even this uh, 
lucky situation to have high oil prices after <laughs> our government uh, serves to nothing because all this money was for the companies. Uh, it is clear that, okay. Secondly, about just an EITT initiative, <clears throat> a lot of what I just said is about just an EITT initiative. This is the concept, what I, the, uh, I talk about the new division of labor, international division of labor, and that was uh, just an EITT, ITT initiative to, uh, to break this, this unfair uh, international division of labor, to propose to the world, that, okay, we have all of, of us to, to assume our responsibility to combat uh, climate change, etc. So we propose to the world to keep underground our, the biggest oil reserve of our country. But the reserve partially, not totally, is in a, a very biodiverse region. In fact, it's a national park, Yasuni. We spent six years trying to collect some money because the proposal was, okay, we sacrifice a lot of our oil revenue but at least you have to contribute with half of this money that we are uh, renouncing to, okay? Well, we spent six years trying to, to call people, to call enterprises, to call uh, big nations, etc., in order to contribute to the initiative, and in that sense, financial dimension was a failure. It not, the, the initiative does not was not a failure in the sense that uh, environmental consensus in our country has changed. Uh, we create a lot of very important concept. This concept, the new division of labor, the concept of net avoided emissions, that was the concept, no? Uh, to, to, to ask for a contribution for the Yasuni ITT. If we extract this uh, oil, well, when this oil will be spent, more or less 400 million of tons of CO2 emissions uh, will be expelled to the atmosphere. So in the same logic like than Kyoto, we estimate the cost of this, and that was the contribution that we were asking for. Well, in, in this sense, no, almost nobody contributed to the initiative. So the last year I have to, to take one of the most, if not the most, hard decision in my government to extract, to continue exploiting this oil in the Yasuni area. I can, I can guarantee you, and we have a presidential decree or ordering that, that uh, the, the, the park has more or less 100 hectares of uh, one, one million hectares of an area of one million hectares. We will affect less than 500 hectares, but we're going to obtain more or less $20 billion that we need for our people, for our childhood, for our road, for our energy, etc. Professor has, or oh, the question says, how that could be sustainable. Believe it or not, the most important, the biggest problem for our forest is not oil. It's the expansion of the agricultural frontier. And in order to stop that, we have to create uh, jobs income in other sectors of the economy. Usually this is very poor people. Poverty also affects nature, you know? Uh, so, even more, with this money, I mentioned that we have almost 20% of our country protected. You know? this is, these are national parks, etc., And uh, that, uh, well, we have the National Park Yasuni, 
but we don't have the, the means in order to, to survey, to, to take care of these important parks. So with this money, part of the money will serve to increase the means. How do you say in English where the park is? Rangers. Rangers, uh, vehicles, uh, cameras, etc., to control our forest. Because the main problem is not oil. It's the expansion of the agricultural frontier, the logging, logging. logging illegal logging, etc. And we, we don't have the capacity to control that. With the money, we can. So some people oppose the presidential decision. They have the right to do so. But sometimes the information is not right. They are manipulating because they, pres they present our decision as all or nothing, Yasuni or oil. That is not true. Is one ten percent of Yasuni? One, one thing or, of 1% one of Yasuni or $20 billion. $20 billion that we need to eliminate as soon as possible poverty in our country. So the initiative and the decision are completely sustainable. OK? Thank you. So um, this is a question from the audience. Um, in the past, in the last two years, Ecuador's involvement with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and uh, American Ed Snowden have focused attention on Ecuador's foreign policy stance. You have been willing to take positions that put you and your country at odds with the global community. At the same time, your opponents have criticized you for the lack of transparency and openness in media in Ecuador. How do you reconcile, reconcile your seemingly liberal position in the case of WikiLeaks? and Snowden with the criticism that you're facing domestically? First of all, somebody could explain me what is international community, because I thought that Ecuador is also part of the international community. So I have to reconcile with international community. What international community? We are also international community. Latin America is also international community. Africa is also international community. Well, you know, that is uh, the hegemony that try to practice some countries. Uh, well, we have to refuse this, to reject this. Anyway, uh, Ecuador is a sovereign country. According to international law, we have the right to give asylum to any citizen in the world. And according, according to the founding letter of the United Nations, any citizen in the world can ask for asylum to any sovereign country. So we have exercised sovereignty. We don't have to explain to, or to ask permission to anybody, to any country in order to do so. But why we gave asylum to Julian Assange? Not to Snowden, to Julian Assange. <coughs> Not because we agree with, that, with what he did, but because clearly there was no guarantee, guarantee of the due process. For this reason, for instance, some senators threat Julian Assange, Amina Sanam, threaten Julian Assange in order to process him, to suit him with a law with death penalty. We don't have death penalty in our country. According to the Inter-American Human Rights Convention, no, death penalty is against human rights. For this reason, we gave him the asylum. Not because we agree with all what he did, not because we don't go want that he, he will be investigated in Sweden, etc. Because there was no guarantee of the due process. And, well, how can I conciliate that with the situation of the media in our country? It's perfectly coincident because in our country there are completely free press and, fr and free expression. Well, you have to travel to our country. So I don't, there is a propaganda every day in the front pages of the newspapers attacking the government because usually in Latin America, I, I talked to, talk to you about power in Latin America. Well, 
The problem of Latin America is that historically it has been controlled by some elite. These elites control the media, control the newspapers, etc. And they are against the government. And they published every day, publish every day whatever they want. But this is the major proof that there is free press in our country. Because in a country without free press, how can you read? every day in the front pages of the papers that there is no free press, OK? <laughs> yeah. So it's propaganda. But I invite all of you to come to the country to feel <laughs> liberty, freedom, but also to feel sovereignty. All right, so we have time for one more question. Uh, the question is uh, short, um, and uh, it involves the, the challenge that, frankly, is the, the great diversity that is Ecuador, not just in its biodiversity, but also in its ethnic diversity. Yes, yes. Would you please outline your points of agreement and disagreement uh, with the indigenous movement? Again, what indigenous movement? We have several indigenous movements. It's true. The biggest one is Conaye. And part of the Conaye makes opposition to our government. Other part is supporting our government. But also you have FEI, Federación Ecuatoriana Indios, the oldest indigenous organization in our country. This organization supports our government. You have also FENOCIN supporting the government. You have, you have also, uh, I, I am forgetting one. FEINE is supporting, well, it's independent. <laughs> so <laughs> what uh, indigenous movement? That is the problem because they are picking what indigenous leader, what indigenous movement is against the government in order to publish, to give them a front coverage, etc. cetera. No? But I can tell you, well, you have visited our country. Last presidential election, we won in an overwhelming way in indigenous regions. We have a lot of support between indigenous people. But we have, yes, the opposition of some indigenous leaders. And why? Because they have, some of them are right wing, OK? Others are extreme left. Or oh, according to them, they are extreme left. That is not to be extreme left. So for instance, this extreme left wing, what is not suggesting, trying to impose not mining, not oil, not hydroelectrics, they want to govern without winning elections. That is no democracy. So, and they are asking for impossible things. So it's not possible to conciliate with them. And even more, most part of them are very violent. This is not political correct to, to say, but it's the truth, OK? There is a lot of violence. Anyway, I can tell you that we have, and we are very pr proud to have a lot of support between indigenous community, most part of indigenous community. Well, President Correa, I congratulate you and your country for the transformation that I've seen in the past few years. And thank you for coming to Yale today and sharing thank you, your, your thoughts. Thank you, Professor.